I found your message when I got back to the hotel. I asked you to phone. I figured you wouldn't mind if I came in person. I figured you would. Why? You impressed me this morning as a man who would bet on anything. Almost anything, depending on the odds. I bet you'd like to hear the story of my life. What do you bet? My story against yours. <laughs> you gotta bet. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by William Falcon, who is the CEO of Grid AI. Thanks for joining today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Scott. Really excited so, to be here. Yeah, I am, I am as well. Uh, you are the creator of the open source project PyTorch Lightning. And of course, you know, as all of us know, I think PyTorch has become this dominant player. Uh, can you talk specifically about the Lightning portion that you've, uh, you've developed? Yeah, definitely. So. Lightning, you know, if you, if you do PyTorch, um, what you end up finding out over time is that you end up repeating a lot of the same code, right? So you have this training loop, you load data, and then eventually you end up with kind of re repeated code over many projects. And when you start trying to scale that up, especially in like an academic or corporate setting, there's a lot of this process of cleaning that code up into, you know, turning it to production ready or being able to publish it. Um, so for many years, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of research, um, starting in my undergrad, really. And kind of the, the core ideas there were, how do you decouple models from the data, from the training? Um, and this evolved, you know, this is kind of my undergrad project for a while. And then, you know, it wasn't until I got to my PhD and, and then Facebook uh, research where um, Lightning kind of took shape, uh, well, the current API at least. And basically the, the main idea there is, it structures your code for you, so it decouples the hardware, so you can run on GPUs, TPUs, CPUs, whatever you want uh, without changing your code, and also allows for the best practices. So basically, all of that engineering that you do over and over again when you're doing PyTorch basically gets removed, right? So you can focus on like actually doing the science, which is it could be you know predicting the stock market or breast cancer detection, whatever your work is, instead of trying to figure out how to distribute things over GPUs. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what's quite interesting, and, and we'll get into more of this is the narrative around the fact that you are really obsessive when it comes from the perspective of the developers that are building these machine learning, deep learning algorithms and models. Uh, and because you yourself have spent time doing it, you understand the pain points. And I think you're really addressing some of the core quintessential pain points that so many millions are really facing. So in, in the case, again, going back to the, the original project on the PyTorch Lightning, you know, to your point, it was designed to create scalable deep learning models that could actually easily run on distributed hardware while uh, then keeping the models uh, hardware agnostic, uh, as well as, uh, you know, like, like I said, having to not having to actually, um, you know, clean up the, clean up the models, um, you know, in the process of, you know, developing these things. Um, in the, in the sp specific aspects of, you know, transitioning to grid AI, now you're actually even taking that even, um, you know, even, even better in the sense of, you know, making sure that they don't have to worry about the, the actual hardware itself. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, when you, you know, how does Grid AI enable training a models on hundreds of, of cloud GPUs and TPUs uh, so that they can actually focus on the MLs and, and not the infrastructure? Yeah, so you hit it right on the spot. Look, Grid is basically not an extension of Lightning, but it's it kind of gives Lightning all the other kind of superpowers that you can't really have in a open source project or or like one project, right? Because you have to coordinate hardware, there's stuff and permissions, data. There are a lot of things that go into the research process, right? So if you think about, you know, everyone talks about production models, right? There's a whole world 
that happens before you put something in production, which is really the research side of it, right? And that, if you're a data scientist at a company, that could be, you know, 10 minutes of a baseline and you kind of like run a baseline and see where it gets you and then decide if you're going to, you know, ele elevate that baseline into, into a model that, you know, could hit some sort of production metric. Or if you're in academia, then that's also actual research, right? So you're actually trying to publish papers and iterating through ideas. And then everything in between, which is um, improving your baselines, uh, getting new data, modifying your model, and, and, and getting more complicated. So all of that, there's so many nuances there. Like, how do you get data at scalable? How do you, how do you transfer data from your corporate systems or your academic um, clusters into a system that you can train on? How do you do it at scale, right? So when you spin up you know, 50, 100 machines at once, and they'll have to access the same data, you have a lot of issues there, right? Um, artifacts, storing, logs, all the things that we don't want to be spending time on, right? So that's really what, what Grid does. It lets you basically just forget about that. Now, Grid is uh, framework agnostic, so you could run this on PyTorch, TensorFlow, whatever you want, but you mm -hmm. really get the power of it when you run with Lightning, because when you couple Lightning with Grid, we can do really, really incredible things that um, people really haven't been doing before. So it opens the door for, for a different paradigm, really, uh, which, you know, we'll see, we'll see what we can do over the next few years. Um, but, you know, if you get on Grid today, you can start to see a lot of that. So Grid is really that. It's, it's getting all the ML ops out of the way so you can focus on actually what you care about. Because in, in my view, the, the people who are developing the models um, should be the ones also kind of like productionizing and testing it because you can look at production as basically... Uh, a held out test set where the data is just coming in real time from the users, right? Now, now, you're in a very unique position because I think not many startups can actually say that they have this close um, synergistic aspect. So because of the fact that you've developed Lightning, um, what uniquely, you know, what advantages does that give you in terms of making sure that Grid AI works really beautifully with it uh, relative to something that comes even closest to your competitor? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, as you know, when you, when you build something, you know, every single nook and cranny of it, you know, all the nuances of how it operates. So there are a lot of um, different optimizations that you can take, right? So things like marrying it to the right hardware, things like when you want to productionize, how do you do that really easily and fast? Um, how do you automatically distribute things over 10, 20, 100, 200 GPUs? Because with Lightning, you still have to do that yourself. Even though Lightning will say, yes, you can do the 200 GPUs on your own, you still have to have the hardware ready to go, right? And that's a lot of lot, lot of nuance. And then once you do do that, there's so many other things about how you connect the, the nodes, how they all communicate together. So there's a lot of stuff there. Um, and then there's, there's a lot of it in terms of the actual code that you're running, right? So um, when, you're, when you're running your own script on your own and it's lightning, you still have to kind of modify the code a bit to say, okay, put this model with this data or whatever it is. Uh, when you get into grid though, um, a lot of this can be done automatically for you, right? And so some of these features will be coming out um, over the next year or so. But uh, today you can see the power of it. The very beginning of it really is on this distributed training side. Yeah, it's interesting because I think in many ways you, you, it's it's a natural evolution and, and extension of the, the work that you were doing at Lightning um, in terms of, I think, like you said, um, you know, installing the grid CLI, training on the cloud with one command, monitor and manage, managing the training infrastructure via the web app or the, you know, and then and then analyzing the experiments with the tensor board, or you even mentioned saving the artifacts and the cumbersomeness aspects of that, as well as analyzing debugging using the GPU powered uh, notebooks or v VS Code, for example. So you really kind of thought through all the kind of, you know, areas that people are gonna get bogged down and try to, create frictionless workflow in such a way that the researchers that have actually started to baseline and to experiment and get metrics in the production can start to really scale it quickly with the least amount of friction and, and pain points. Is that right? You may also like our quarterly Astro Perkins event that brings some of the most notable experts and category leading startups in their area of sustainability and human survival on Earth and in space. To register, visit astroperkins.com forward slash events. Yeah, and, that, and that's really a testament to the team. Um, I mean, we've everyone on the Lightning team and the Grid team has spent time either 
you know, publishing papers, doing research at big tech companies, or actually putting models into production. And, and most of the time we've done all of them, right? So I've, I've put a lot of models into production as well, my previous companies. I've done the actual academic research. So I know all the pain points and we all feel them as well. So I think that's why you get such a cohesive experience because we are, you know, we're, we are the people building it. It's, mm-hmm. it's not something where you have engineers kind of like taking specs and trying to match them, don't quite understand what they're building and that you can see the disconnect when that happens usually. Yeah, and again, I think this this goes back to the comment that I made earlier is that you, you're, you, your team is really truly obsessive because you guys are coming from the perspective of the actual users themselves. Um, so with that, I think, um, you know, I think the question I have is, you know, there is never a perfect system, right? So as there's this synergistic hook in with the API from the lightning to the, the grid, um, what are other things that you feel like needs to f- be further enhanced from a product roadmap that's going to make the experience even better? Yeah, I mean, look, we're just getting started, right? So we have a, a long vision of things we want to do. <laughs> it's just going to take a lot of time to get there. Um, but, you know, the, the main thing that we work on is really latency across everything, right? So Lightning is how fast do things start, how fast do things train. At Grid is same thing, how fast do things start, how fast do things train. When you're iterating, prototyping, and moving through your ideas, the last thing you want to do is wait for a machine to spin up, you know, in 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. So we work a lot to make that happen. And I mean, we have some of the best infrastructure engineers around to try to get at like the lowest latency possible. So in the ideal world, you don't have to wait. The machines are just there and they just start and things work quickly. And, you know, we'll get there, but it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, so I think those are the, around the, the, the major challenges. And then as, when it gets into data, right? So, I mean, everyone talks about how knowing data is, I think, when you try grid, we simplify the MLOps so much that, you know, the actual training and running of stuff takes a few seconds. You just like pick a script, you drop it in in the UI, you select the hardware, you add some arguments and off you go. But really where, because, because that's so easy now, um, kind of the struggle is really how do you get data on the platform, right? And it's, it's trivial, like you can get data from any clusters or whatever you want, but we're talking about production systems as well. So how do you do real time data? How do you do data that like, you know, has to be refreshed so so often. So there, those are a lot of challenges that we're working on as well. Well, again, I think, uh, you know, when you put into context of, let's say, large enterprises that has massive amount of data on the production system, I mean, you know, what, would you, what you're talking about is uh, really uh, a huge, huge issues and a real sore point. And then, of course, you talked about also uh, speed, speed of uh, how quickly can you get some of these machines up and running as well. Um, so at the end of the day, it's about latency, but also scale. Um, so I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about use cases and the kinds of customer profiles that would be ideal for you guys? Yeah, so we cover everything from individuals, right? So if you're a hacker, or you're a Kaggler, you're a data scientist, you can just get on the platform, you're a researcher, student, you get on and you hack away at your, yeah, your academic data sets or your Kaggle data sets or or probably your smaller data sets, it's a very easy use case. So that, that's, a, that's, that's not a hard thing that we, we can't handle. And then from there you get into the teams, right? So that's really startups, mid-level companies, even teams within a large company. Um, so th- those people can kind of work on that, on that area. And uh, then you get into the enterprises. So the enterprises, you know, it really depends. Um, I don't think that we can cover every enterprise today, um, mo- mostly because you know, we don't know the nuances of dealing with like medical data or financial data, for example, right? I mean, I, I come from Goldman Sachs um, in the previous life, so I, I understand that a little bit better. <laughs> so I know what it's going to take to get there. Um, but we have started to work with some of those companies already um, to bring them basically grid on their own clusters, right? So on-prem deployments, that kind of stuff. So it's, um, I think today we shine really at the individual and the teams. And then where we're headed is really um, to address the needs of the enterprises as well, which is, a lot more than just training, right? It's security, it's auditing, it's those different things that companies care about. Well, I think in many ways, I think from a go-to-market, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful strategy because um, the over-iterative uh, process with the individuals and the SMBs or smaller, uh, smaller teams helps to refine so that you could be enterprise-grade ready, ready at some point in the, in the near future. So I think that's a pretty good strategy at all, um, uh, after all. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your kind of recent funding with from Bain Capital Ventures, Index Ventures, and First Minute. Uh, what do you think particularly was really striking for them as to why they felt convicted enough to make that investment in you guys? 
Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we, we did our, um, when we, when we did our funding, it was, it was different because I think a lot of startups when they're coming up to start the companies, they're, they're trying to find that kind of product market fit that, you know, that community side of it. And that really takes a long time, right? The, the product building, you can, you can get right. And it's really, it comes down to execution on your team, but the building of the community, that part can take a bit. And, you know, by the time that we started getting funding, we already had a lot of that. And mostly it's because, you know, when I started Lightning, I wasn't trying to specifically turn it into a company, right? I was just like, hey, this is a, this is a cool tool that I think helps people. You know, people at Facebook are using it. Other companies were using it um, while, while I was still at Facebook. And, and then by the time we ended up getting funding, um, we just had so much traction already. We had so many users, so many companies, so many um, academic labs using it as well that, you know, it was, I guess, underwriting a bit of the execution risk on the, on the, on the enterprise side of things. And, you know, it's an iterative process. And I hope that we, we get it right, because I think on the open source side, there are a few models that work. And we're hoping that we can be another successful model there so that, you know, other people who are working on their open source projects um, can get some ideas on how they might mo want to monetize their projects as well. Yeah, I, I really like what you're saying. I think um, open source project ha has been really just an incredible way for for organizations and movements to uh, not just you know make a make a momentum, but in, in many ways actually show that they can actually become a viable ongoing con business concern as well. Um, so there's there's a quite a bit of interesting things in the sense of you know as others are listening, especially those that have ambition to start their own um, you know private entity. This notion of starting with uh, open source, you know, creating a community, uh, making sure that they see the value and they start to participate in that community. And that as you roll out new features and capabilities, they're also the first ones adopted as well. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to other startups um, that have, that can learn from really, you know, I think the path that you've taken, and I think it, was, it you couldn't have been a better path in some ways, right? Uh, both the synergy in terms of the lightning with the grid f to the actual founding of the, and the development of the community to leveraging that community and then, then launching that business. Don't forget to visit astroperkins.com to register for our next quarterly events. Past and current speakers include Julianne Hugh, actress, dancer, and winner of Dancing with the Stars, Damien Vaughn, former NFL player, Neil Gregory, Chief Thought Leadership Officer at the IFC World Bank, and many more. To register, visit astroperkins.com and click on Events. Yeah, I think, I think the, the key there is, like I said, you know, Lightning, when, when I started working on Lightning and it, it was really a, a labor of love, right? So it wasn't about trying to create a company. It wasn't about monetizing. It wasn't about building anything like that. And I think when you have that mentality, you end up hopefully creating something that people care about. And because you're not trying to make money, right? You're trying to build something that's useful that will actually solve people's needs. And great is really just a consequence of what users wanted, right? They wanted to train on the cloud. They wanted to train on scale. They wanted to solve deployments. There were a lot of things that users have been asking for for you know, I guess a year and a half at this point. And so great, it comes, comes out of that. It's a need for the community as well. So I think the real answer there is focus on the community first, always. Like that is the number one goal, right? You, you build what the community wants, you help the community as much as possible. And then if you can monetize them uh, along the way, then perfect, right? But I think if you start trying to do that up front, um, it, it's disingenuous and doesn't really, doesn't really help the field. I think holistically AI is where it is because people in the open source community have done a lot to get it there. And so we're just trying to get back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the advice that you're giving is uh, spot on. And it's, it's actually really practically difficult to do for many startups, right? I think most startup founders are, uh, you know, trying to incubate an idea because they're looking to monetize it and build their own wealth. Um, so how can they start to kind of separate the, their, maybe their aspiration versus the, the need to really stay focused on the user group and the needs that they're asking for? I think if you're not spending money, like, you know, once you have taken on funding, you have employees, you're kind of racing against the clock, right? Because you have burn, you have, to, you have to power through that. I mean, I, you know, I worked on Lightning over easily four years, right? Through my undergrad, PhD, and everything else, where I wasn't getting paid, it was just my own work. So I didn't have that pressure to monetize. And I think if you can somehow 
incubate the idea and get the traction before you really have to go monetize and, and do what you need to do, then I think it alleviates a lot. Of, it solves a lot of those problems. Just self-sustain. Um, I mean, even I think up to basically last year around this time when we took on funding, that's really, it was me and like open source people mostly. Like I didn't have employees. I don't have anyone else, right? And at that point, we already had enough traction. We already have enough proof of concept. So you don't need a lot of people. You just need to work hard. I, I don't know what the statistic is, but it's like 1% of developers are the ones making all the open source stuff out there. So it <laughs> doesn't take a lot of teams. That's amazing. Wow. There's a, a, just a ton of um, valuable insights and, and lessons learned that you're sharing with us today. Uh, my last question for you is, uh, as you look to the kind of the future of AI design, modeling, testing, scaling, uh, what comes to mind beyond what we talked about in terms of product, product extension and roadmap? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, the, the real insights are going to come when we figure out how to I think lightning gets us really close, right? But go from research to production. And I know, you know, everyone uses that sentence to go from research to production, PyTorch, TensorFlow, everyone says that, right? But the fact is that that's not easy. Um, and the reason is because you have to give researchers the flexibility to be as unstructured as possible, right? And so once you do that though, it makes it really hard to productionize something because that flexibility means your code's all over the place because you have to, because you have to, I think that the, the main key today for AI is how fast can you move through ideas? That's really the, the predictive power if, if you're going to do well. It's not whether your ideas are amazing or not. It's how fast can you try a bunch of ideas, really? So it's a thoroughput. And in that flexibility, Lightning structure that for you. So I think we're getting there. But how do we go into flawless deployments where you have to do nothing? That's going to take a little bit more work. And you know we're working with key people to help us do that, right? Um, tr trying to figure that part out. So that'll be that. I think that'll be the sweet spot. It's when we can get that part right. And as of 1.0, which is around September last year, um, 2020, we started focusing on production, right? So you can do Torch Script, you can export to Onyx very easily. But there's a lot more than we can do than just that. So that that's really, I think, where the focus will be. Well, I see uh, big, big potential ahead. So with that, I've been joined by William Falcon, who is the CEO of Grid AI. Thanks for joining today. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.